Um, for people just showing up, um, there's still plenty of seats available at the front of the room. Don't be shy. Um, there's room for everyone in our room. Um, so welcome everyone. I hope you are enjoying um, the this year's HCIL Symposium from the comfort of your own home. Um, you have made it into session six, which is all about learning, computing, and mathematics. Um, my name is David Weintraub. I'm an assistant professor in the College of Education and in the iSchool and a proud member of the HCIL. Um, and it is my great pleasure to uh, moderate uh, five wonderful talks today. Um, like with other sessions, the plan is each speaker is going to have 15 minutes to present their work. Um, I kind of expect each of them to, to speak for around 10, 12 minutes, leaving, leaving us a few minutes after each talk for questions. Um, I will be monitoring chat and the Discord channel, so feel free to drop your questions in either of those places, or um, at the end, it, with time allotting, um, you, you can raise your hand and, and sh ask your question that way, but um, I'm comfortable kind of whatever everyone prefers. Um, okay, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker of the session, uh, Jimmy Lin, who will be presenting work entitled Bridging the Gap from Blocks to Text, Designs for Supporting Learners Moving from Block-Based to Text-Based Programming. Jimmy, the floor is yours. All right. Um, let me make sure the spotlight. All right. So I'm assuming everybody can see me good and hear me well. Okay, perfect. So let me make sure. That, okay. So hi, everybody. My name is Jimmy Lin. I'm a first year towards second year doctor student at here in Maryland. Uh, I'm major mainly lived in the College of Ed, uh, TL, teaching, learning, and technology, learning, and leadership. Sorry. Uh, so I'm presenting the uh, work on bridging the gap from block-based to text, uh, supporting the uh, learners moving from block-based to text-based programming. I'm assuming many, some of you may be familiar with block-based programming environment, but for those of you who does not know, this is one of the typical uh, block-based programming environment. It's called Scratch. It's developed by MIT Media Lab. Uh, so you can select a block on the left and then drag it to the middle uh, and then you can make the cat flying in this case. Uh, so you normally see the left, middle and right section, but in some other cases like this one code.org, the animation is not on the right, it's on the left, but you still drag the sec uh, blocks from the middle section to the workspace. So there are also many curricula that support block-based programming environment, including exploring computer science, AP College Board, and computer science principle. And there are many, many block-based programming environments out there. There are only a couple that's uh, gradually showing up on the screen. Um, in this study, I examined over 100 uh, block-based programming environment out there. Here's just a couple that's more famous or more known one. And for the, like for if you're going, if a student's end goal is going to a computer science career and then end up joining all these big name tech companies, they will not be able to use block-based programming in their um, in their workforce. So that's why like text-based programming is needed. So here comes to my research question. The first one is according to to the academic academic literature, what are the current available block-based programming environments and what are their characteristics? Second is in what ways do block-based programming environments try and support the transition to text-based programming? So in my method, uh, I go through um, Blocks and Beyond Conference and IEEE Symposium on Visual Language and Human-Centric Computing uh, to search for all the block-based programming environments. And I also use the keyword um, block-based programming in both ACM and IEEE digital libraries. And here I define the exclusion criteria First, if a block-based programming environment cannot be located via Google search or not available to public or have been shut, shut down, that's being excluded. And if a block-based programming environment requires the user to pay for the access or requires some of the purchase of the hardware, like a robot, a microcontroller before access the environment. Third is if a block-based programming environment is only available as a source code like on GitHub that need to be downloaded, compiled, and hosted via command line, which we don't seem as feasible for educators or students to do. Last one is if the block-based programming environment has not been updated in five years or it's been too old to run on the current Mac OS 10.15 when the research is conducted. 
So we found about 100 uh, unique block-based program environments in the literature and the detailed analysis was only able to conduct it on the 41 of them that we're able to interact with. And here's a breakdown of the venues we found on block-based program environments. Not surprising, like um, Blocks and Beyond Workshop and IEEE Symposium on Visual Language and Human-Centric Computing had most of them, but there are a couple more in IDC, CHI, 6 d and uh, others. And also we found that this is a trend of the block-based programming environments that are being published. The ones they need to mention here, the most famous one, Scratch, was developed in 2000, 2009. So you see the trends going up afterwards, especially in 2015 and 2017. Then we analyzed the uh, domain of the block-based programming environments. Uh, in, um, many of them do games. That's uh, one way to attract students to interact on the play, uh, programming side. And then we can see a lot on data science and physical computing and multimedia as well. Please note that there are um, like one block-based programming environments could live in multiple domains, such as Scratch, it's both in games, uh, you can use add-on to do physical computing and also multimedia and others. And we also analyze the running environment of a block-based programming environment. Majority of them run in browsers, so which you can use it on a Chrome. So it's really helpful for, student, for school district who use a Chromebook. Uh, some others, gives the option to download Windows or Mac and some run on iOS or Android. And so here's the most exciting part about it. It's a relationship with text-based programming. So we defined four different um, relationships with text-based programming, blocks only, dual modality, one-way transition, and hybrid. I'm going to start going one by one here. So the first one is blocks only. The most typical one is Scratch. It's like 21 environment out of 40 we found in block, blocks only. So there's no support for text-based programming environment in this block-based programming environment whatsoever. You can see it's just on this screen, only blocks you can drag, drop, and program it. There's no way to find the underlying text-based uh, code at all. The second one is called dual modality. We have 13 of them. It's an environment. It's an environment that supports both block-based and text-based authoring. But we also break it down to two different ones. First one is called single view dual modality. So the user is able to see both block-based and text-based representations on the same page. For example, here it's called BlockPy. You see the uh, blocks version on the left and text version on the right. Uh, once you change something on the left, it show up immediately on the right. And you can also add something on the right as a Python code, and then it will automatically generate the block version of it on the left. Second one is called bidirectional dual modality. So the user can move back and forth between block-based and text-based representation of the program, but can only interact with one at a time. So instead of doing on a single page, now you can only looking at and answering editing on a single interface. So here, pencilcode.net, you can do the blocks, and then you can hit a button, then change it to the code version, and then hit a button again, change back to blocks, but you cannot see both at the same time. Now the third one is called one-way transition. So the user can move from block-based to text-based print presentation of the program, but not backwards. Also here, we'll break down to two different ones. So first one is read-only one-way transition. So the user can view a text-based version of the program, but cannot edit it. So the example here is code.org. You create the code, you use blocks, and then you hit a button on show codes. Then you will see the um, space in the middle that great pops out. And then it has all the underlying text-based version of that code, but you cannot edit it, or you cannot do anything with it except viewing it. And second version of it is editable one-way transition. So the user can convert their block-based programming to a text-based form, and then they can continue to work on the program in the text form. So here the example is VaxVR, uh, which you write things in blocks, very similar to Scratch. Then you can see, you can hit the top right button and then see a code view, like in the text version. And then there's a button on the bottom right that says convert to text project. So once the user convert to a text project, they cannot come back. So this is one-way transition, but then 
the user able to keep programming or keep modifying, add on new cool things in the text version of it. Last but not least, it's called hybrid. So it's blend the feature of block-based composition along with the feature of conventional text editors. So here is the example is called Greenfoot. Uh, so you can see, you can write the code, you can, or you can drag and drop. So it's blind the feature of both blocks and text altogether. So again, come back to this uh, relationship with text-based programming. We have four of those categories and then these are the counts that we found. But the ultimate question is which one's better? And we don't know yet. So that's part of things I'm looking forward to do more research in my uh, future studies. So here's the conclusion. So if the scratch is so successful, we need to think about the current landscape of block-based programming environments and keep developing block-based programming environment to support students better and help them to transit to text-based programming if their final goal is going to a computer science career. And uh, thank you for listening. If you have questions, feel free to contact me or uh, David, yeah. Wonderful. Um, thank you, Jimmy. And we have a good amount of time for questions. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to drop it in chat or Discord or raise your hand and I can uh, give you the floor. So I have a question. Oh, Kara, is your hand up? Your hand is up. Yes. Please, yeah. Awesome. Okay, that was awesome. Um, and I, as I said in chat, like I, the slides are just brilliant. That is just, yeah, absolutely. Okay, question for you though. Um, uh, given that you now know more about this than possibly anybody else in the world, um, you and David together, um, if somebody like me was like, hi, I know the basics of HTML and that's all as far as I've gotten with programming, mm -hmm. um, but I wanna build a little interactive something, mm -hmm. What piece of software would you hand to me knowing that I ha don't have a strong background at all? Um, yeah. So I would need to know what's your end goal with that software. Are you handed to a student to play at the game to teach them something that Scratch might be might be work just because that's the animation it's quick easy. But if you're present use trying to use uh, to create a like a visualized data dashboard on the data then presenting it to a company that's going to a totally different direction, so. Got it. Okay. Um, what, so, so uh, say that um, I wanted to build something like a, a, a self-contained interactive th game that's just for fun. Like it's, it's not formally for education, um, and, but I wanted it to look nice. I mean, I, I would suggest if you only know HTML, I'm assuming only HTML, um, then Scratch could be a good starting point for you because there's a Scratch as a community on the world. So like you can remix something from other people, you might be able to find something doing similar things. Like I know some people are trying to do like a pick a restaurant thing, but then on Scratch there's a pick a movie thing. So like you can just remix of it and use some of the template, uh, save the time on mixing all the graphics and other, and you can just cut, like remix it. Awesome, thanks, Jimmy. Great, and we had a question come through on chat that I wanna um, raise. This is from Kevin Shockley asking, do you think block programming can do things besides programming, like how to schedule bill payments, order groceries, et cetera? That were coming together, linking with the APIs. Um, I'm assuming, like, not, I'm not. I don't want to talk about bill payments because that will have involved bank security things. That just not get more complicated. But like other groceries or other things, it all depends on the API and then the environments that underlie it. So basically, every block-based programming environment get translated to a text-based programming and then translate it to um, machine binary code to a computer can understand that way to do things. So that's, I, I would say that's possible, but also depends on the environment you find online who may support or may not support the way that you want to do things. And also you need to find out if that grocery or like bill payment support the API that come in from like parameters and others. 
Wonderful. Thank you. And uh, Marika, so you you have your hand up, please. Yeah, sort of related to that question, I was wondering for each of the block-based environments, you shared do domains. So, and I was wondering how you determined those, whether that was based on how were they used in the research papers or your opinions of what they were, because for instance, like I've thought of like, I've thought of Scratch as something where you could build like models and simulation, but that might be more like data science than the than the multimedia that you had it listed as. So I was just wondering where those came from um, and kind of if you have examples of breaking out of those domains for some of them. Uh, it is more on uh, like my per my view of it. Uh, just like some of the paper we can find the paper that's saying we developed this one based on something and it's some of them is more, uh, let me show the screen, I think that. Yeah. Some of them it's easier to say, like if you're looking at Blockly SQL, you know that's data science trying to deal with databases, uh, but some of the others that's more like, I go in there, I take a look, poke around, uh, play around with it and figure out which ones fit best. Um, so scratch that one, actually we try to eliminate the add-ons because add-ons could be like massive. You, that basically expands the scratch to everything. Uh, so we removed that, we did not examine on the add-ons because that people say like you can download this add-on or others and then that makes not entirely good. So we come back to just original scratch without add-ons and then it fits back best with games and multimedia. Wonderful. And um, if I, I'll ask one quick question um, as Marika gets her cell, her slide set up. Um, so Jimmy, was there anything that surprised you in doing this analysis that you expected one thing and found something else? I was expecting to see more variety on the categories rather than, uh, I mean, blocks only is the most popular one than dual modality, but then for one way transition hybrid is so less. So, and then also there's nobody doing the comparison between it. So I'm interested to see like, well, why is that the case and why people, is people thinking dual modality is the best way or which one's best way, because that's still in the line. We don't know yet. Great. Um, well, I look forward to finding out with you. Yeah. Um, okay, thank you, Jimmy. Uh, so next up, and we're gonna look for your email. All right. So apologies for the technical difficulty there. Um, so quick, as everyone saw um, in real time, um, we said we're going to hear first from Janet B, who's going to present her work uh, entitled Computational Bodies Grounding Computational Thinking Practices in Embodied Gesture. Uh, and thank you for uh, hopping in, Janet. The floor is yours. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Janet B, as Dr. David just said. Um, today, I'll be presenting work on <clears throat> that is part of our effort on bringing computational thinking practices to elementary classrooms. So this work is titled Computational Bodies and we see how children are trying to ground computational thinking practices in embodied gestures. Okay. So the context of this study actually shows us how long, young learners who do not have experience with programming languages and syntax express or how they express um, computational thinking ideas using embodied gestures. Sometimes these students actually tend to use their bodies and, and enact computational thinking practices when they try to program robots. So computational thinking here will be described as the skills and concepts and practices that are associated with computational tools as they, as children try to solve problems in, in computational thinking environments. And the framework that we use for this study is captured under the term constructionism, which is a term coined by Simon Papet that supports the idea that computational thinking tools supports learning for young learners. This idea has been further expanded to cover the term called computational thinking which actually describes the concepts and practices that can be used to effectively solve problems using computational tools. And for this study, we actually looked at several elements of computational thinking, including 
developing algorithms, decomposing problems, debugging solutions, and pattern recognition. So the tool we used for this study um, was embodied cognition. Embodied cognition was actually brought in into this study to understand how embodied gestures help young learners enact CT practices. And <clears throat> in this case, we argue that cognition is said to, um, to be embodied when it depends on the features of the physical body of an agent. We believe that bringing um, embodied perspectives to understand computational thinking in math concepts is important given the age group of our learners and the fact that these learners, um, sorry, computational or uh, embodied cognition also has strong um, grounding um, in the in the math literature. So there are generative potentials to understand computational thinking in embodied cognition. The participants for this study were from a fourth grade math classroom in a racially diverse school. And the curriculum that we used for these activities were developed through a research practitioner partnership in a DCPS classroom. And the class was made up of 21 students who worked in pairs. But for this study, we actually selected two pairs of students that we used as local students to collect data. So the methods we used for this study was actually bringing in iPads, serial robots into the classroom that the students actually used to design programs and then also design, design activities on boards that were called the prime number maze. The prime number maze was actually designed by the students on these boards on which they wrote prime numbers and composite numbers and had the task of programming the Sphero robot right here to navigate the maze. The, the, the boards, the maze was constituted of prime and composite numbers and the students had to design a path of prime numbers only and then program the Sphero robot to navigate that maze. For data collection, we had head-mounted cameras on the focal students and stationary cameras positioned at angles to be able to collect data. And the students were also asked questions to understand how they program their robots. And then we analyzed the videos for moments of computational thinking and embodied practices. We had two findings for this study. The first, is that gesture was used as a means of expressing iterative log logic. And the second was that students actually did use their bodies as a resource to solve problems. Okay, so I will talk in detail about our first finding. So the first finding was students use gesturing to enact iterative logic. I'll walk you through the steps onto how the students got to using these um, gestured practices to be able to enact a, 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 an important computational um, concept as iterative logic. So students had to agree on what variable they would uh, manipulate to be able to make their robot move a certain distance. In order to do that, they had to go onto the iPad where we see here on the iPad interface, there's a duration, which is the time and speed. And two of these variables they have to manipulate would either be the time or the speed. And then they would enter either time here or speed here. And then that would be able to give them a distance the sphero would roll. And then from the vignettes we see here, they agree among themselves. We need more seconds or like speed, like speed. That is agreeing on what variable they need to manipulate to be able to get the distance, the sphero move a distance. And then student two would say, said, no, seconds, seconds, agreeing that they should use, they should manipulate the variable of time. And then once they all agree on manipulating the variable of time, so then one then says, maybe try 1.2 seconds, which they enter onto the iPad um, interface. And then student two says, so this is one second. Now gesturing 
emotion using her index and thumb. Now she uses the index and thumb to be able to calculate the distance between two numbers and that she, she describes here on vignette two and says, do one second because you know that's not gonna get you very far from the next square. The next square would be the distance between two numbers moving from one number to the other on the prime number maze. And then this gesture now represents time that is the, the time that the sphere will move from one number to the other and time and, and distance at that moment becomes a concept that all have the same measure. So she now continues counting and says one, uh, two, three, and then that is an iterative um, logic concept that is translated um, onto a computational thinking uh, space. So from vignette one, we understand that Gesturing in this case accomplished four goals for these students. The hand became a unit of measure, the thumb and the index became a unit of measure. And then the hand also helped the students to translate a virtual command that says, roll zero degrees at 80 for one speed, which is one block uh, on, the, on the programming interface into a physical representation. So the block became represented by this gesture. And then gesturing in this case also acted as a cognitive scaffold for, for the, both students to be able to communicate between themselves. And then gesture in this case did support the concept of iterative logic, which again, as I said, is very important in um, computational thinking. For finding two, we saw that students did embody, um, used embodiment as a city problem solving tool. So they did translate on vignette one here, we see on image one, we see how students actually did translate physical movements of the robots onto their body. So if a robot had to move a certain direction, they would move their arm in that direction and mimic or embody uh, a certain direction. And in vignette two, we see how students actually interacted in the environment using their bodies and the interfaces at the same time. And then they engage both bodies and, and their bodies and the tools that were found in the, in the environment to be able to make sense of the representations that were either on the iPad screens or on the learning physical learning environment itself. So for example, on vignette three, we see the student would say this way for 90 and it's actually moving part of her arms, both either both arms or one arm at the same time, representing either the tool, either the robot or an angle. It is worth noticing here that angles for young learners in elementary school are considered as abstract con con concepts in math that can easily not be represented um, physically. But in this case, by bringing these computational tools in this environment, students were able to ground understanding and make meaning of these kind of concepts that are considered abstract. And we can see how they can use their arms to represent angles and that that they, they describe here in these um, vignettes like 270. So an arm that moves one left and one represents the robot could mean 270. And at the same time on vignette four and five, we see both arms that move and meet at a certain angle still represent something called 270 in both cases. So to conclude, we can say that this paper actually highlights ways in which learners can mediate their lack of expression in computational thinking environments by using their bodies to represent some of these computational ideas. And the work actually comes to enrich the CT and embodied cognition literature by showing that embodied practices can be used to uh, um, represent CT concepts. And our findings also do show that embodiments can support and ground understanding of how CT concepts and mathematical concepts can, can be um, intersected and supported. And we also argue that as the CT um, literature grows, we hope that teachers and researchers will understand that there are different ways in which CT concepts can be understood in different learning environments, including environments where robotics are brought in for young learners to, to program. And then we hope that as we collect more data, we can further investigate patterns and find similarities and differences in these embodied expressions and how this 
makes meaning to support learning in these environments. On behalf of my team, Carol, David, and Peter, thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you, Janet. Um, it looks like we have a few minutes for questions. So let me open up the floor to the crowd. I can also take questions in French. My English is going away of in here so long. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I have a question, but I unfortunately cannot ask it in French. So apologies about that. Yeah. You're welcome to answer it in French though, if you feel more comfortable answering in French. Um, <laughs> I'm curious, can you um, talk a little bit about, um, so implications for these findings? You talked a little bit about them in your last slide, but I'm curious, if you were in front of a room full of fourth grade math teachers who are about to teach zero math, kind of what would be some concrete things that you would say to them in terms of kind of helping them attend to this type of mathematical expression that they might not have much experience kind of looking out for or working with? So I will be careful about this knowing that there are math people and embodied cognition specialists in this room. But I think that we can also plug into um, the knowledge of um, uh, embodied cognition specialists and literature to see how they do, do evaluations in these spaces and, and use some of their literature to, to point to math features and say, here is how we can also use these practices that have been traditionally used in math classrooms to be able to evaluate how students make sense of things and learn in computationally enhanced environments. If it can be valid for math, then I think this can be valid. And these are valid and grounded ways of understanding that learning is happening in these spaces. I think. Wonderful. Thank you. We have time for another question. And in the meantime, I'm going to invite Marika to try can, and share her I slides think, again. I think we can. Right. Sorry, I, I think was, we I, can also ask, I don't know, Carol, do you know if the, the evaluation tools that exist for embodied cognition? Uh, for teachers in the classroom in particular? Yes. Um, yes. I know, so there's a, there's a, um, a group that is examining that stuff. So if you look at uh, the Nevada Math Project, they've been looking specifically at professional development with math teachers in the classroom in those practices. Um, and so I'm sure that, and I think that grant maybe has ended, but it was a statewide grant. So like um, teachers from every school in Nevada participated. Um, and so okay. I'm sure that there's useful stuff there, but it's not my area of expertise, unfortunately. Um, okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Um, and I will also say I, you know, um, the, the, the math side of things, um, there are going to be some fundamental differences, right, uh, with uh, CT and gesture um, that I'm sure even the, the brilliant people at the Nevada Math Project haven't found yet. And so like that's still like a whole untapped area. And it's just it's, it's also just brand new um, in the in the professional development math literature as well. Okay, thank you. Um, wonderful. Okay. So thank you again, Janet. Uh, and so now back to our kind of regularly scheduled programming. Um, so I'm going to try and share my screen and hopefully the result is that everyone sees Marika's beautiful slides. I see lots of thumbs ups. Okay. Um, so with uh, much anticipated suspense has been building. Um, so, right, and so now we're gonna um, hear from Marika presenting her work, Designing Computer Science Lessons About Tech Woody, and apologies in advance if there's any kind of clunky transitions as I try and navigate um, uh, her slide. So Marika, the floor is yours. Awesome, thank you so much and thank you all for your patience. Um, so, as I was saying, I'm here to discuss my dissertation research. We're gonna talk about how um, youth conceptualize techwity and the ways they translate that, or to translate that potentially into these computer science lessons. So um, we know that the world is filled with technology. 
that uh, we, including today's youth, are using continuously. David, can you do two slides for me? Sorry, I skipped to the beginning. I messed it up already. Should I keep going? Uh, it didn't switch. <laughs> do you see a slide that says tech equity? No, I see the title slide. Oh, sorry. Oh, there we go. Yeah, let me back up. Technical, I... There we go. That's per great. Okay, but the question is, what are these technologies really doing? And what is their purpose? How are they affecting us both overtly and covertly? So for years, news story after news story has identified one problem at a time with technology. And each of these have been fixed. They've individually been solved, but it's one problem being solved rather than recognition of a larger issue. And just this month, New York City said they would stop using robotic dogs for control because there was public outcry over these dogs being creepy. Yet what many who followed this story might not know is all of the other ways that technologies are being used to surveil and track individuals, particularly those who are already marginalized within our society. And together, these examples point to a larger and systemic issue with the technologies we and the youth of our society are using compulsively. And these issues are part of what I call techquity. In my research, I'm focused on techquity and specifically on threats to techquity. Threats to techquity are those aspects of computing and technologies that cause or could cause inequities. Go ahead and click twice. Uh, especially in equity based on membership within a marginalized population. So that's being marginalized based on your race or your immigration status, your gender, sexual orientation, or ability. And these concerns are directly related to the part of computer science standards that's known as the impacts of computing, um, specifically those around social justice and equity. So threats to equity are often interconnected, but I wanted to give a few examples. So this can include algorithmic bias or prejudice in the algorithms that underlie and control all of our technology, excessive data collection, particularly data collection that occurs without the knowledge of the user, the use of this data in targeted advertising, especially in ways that can be predatory towards marginalized populations, facial recognition and voice recognition systems that work differently depending on your skin color, your gender, or your accent, and the underrepresentation of women and people of color in technology and design teams. And so as we increasingly teach computer science with goals of equity and broadening participation in our tech workforce, I propose that we also need to teach about these threats to techquity to prepare youth to be critical consumers and potentially even designers of new technologies. So by partnering with youth and teachers, I've developed three techquity infused computer science lessons. And these were implemented by the teachers in middle grade classrooms. Today, I'm focused on the design sessions in the designing with youth phase and specifically on the ways that the youth designers conceptualize techquity. With this work, I want to answer the questions. Sorry about that. Uh, one more, David, thank you. How do youth present threats to techquity in their lives? How do youth perceptions and examples of threats to techquity shift after being introduced to examples of technological bias? And when designed to teach peers, how do youth present techquity and threats to techquity? So in order to do this, I've worked over the course of the last year with eight youth uh, to learn about how they conceptualize techquity and would teach others about it. All eight youth are black and were between the ages of eight and 14 when the research occurred. Due to social distancing requirements because of COVID, the design team met virtually for all of our design sessions that are discussed in this presentation, but the team had met in person, so all of the team members designed together previously in person. And we utilized the design theory and techniques of cooperative inquiry to design with youth for youth. 
Across six design sessions, the youth completed a number of different design activities that provided valuable information about their conceptualizations of Tequity. Specifically, the youth and adult designers worked together to identify the good and the bad parts of technology before the youth were introduced to Tequity. Then they used line judging to represent the importance they place on certain Tequity concepts. And then they designed teaching scenarios to share about Tequity. They created public service announcements about Tequity and Scratch. And finally, they critiqued the in-progress lesson plans to provide their own feedback. Each session concluded with the youth presenting their designs and an initial examination of the big ideas that emerged during the presentation. These big ideas were then member checked by the youth to ensure that they didn't feel any ideas had been missed or overlooked. Following the design sessions, I reviewed all of the video recordings of the sessions and memoing was used to make note of the salient ideas or quotes from the sessions. And finally, to analyze how definitions of tequity changed, the data were examined chronologically. And during this analysis, we paid special attention to the definitions and examples of tequity provided by the youth. We found that without introduction to the idea of tequity and specific threats to tequity, youth attended to the visible impacts of computing, particularly those that were highly salient in their lives. But when they were introduced to threats to tequity, invisible threats were made visible and the youth had the opportunity to discuss ways that tequity is a product of a larger socio-historical system, grounding those invisible threats in examples that made them visible. And therefore, when designing for their peers, the youth focused on ways to make the invisible visible. And I want to share a few of those. So first, before they were introduced to threats to equity, the youth identified both positive and negative impacts of computing. And this identification was focused mostly on visible impacts of computing and the ways that these impacts were affecting their lives. For some context, these design sessions occurred in April of 2020, when all of the youth had recently transitioned to online education and social distancing. Uh, first, youth focused on the positive impacts of computing, such as being able to connect with others or use technology for entertainment. They also noted negative impacts, such as inequitable access to technology or the possibility of addiction for, to video games and even threats to privacy. And finally, the youth noted times when technology could be both good and bad. For example, one girl discussed security cameras as being good because they can help when someone is breaking into your house, but also annoying because they can catch you when you sneak out. Without prompting, the youth even discussed some less visible threats to equity, but they did so by relying on things that were that they see more visibly. For instance, they identified that Siri and smart speakers can always be listening, but they provided examples of when it doesn't understand or doesn't work without a deeper knowledge or analysis of why that speaker might not be working um, or might not understand accents or a dialogue or even how data is gathered through this listening and might be stored. When youth were introduced to threats to equity and some common examples uh, explained, the youth then started to make connections to their lives and, and discuss these threats, which were often invisible to the naked eye, but can be seen in their everyday realities. For example, when discussing online data collection, the youth brought up examples of targeted advertising based on location and search history, as is seen in these quotes. And they were able to make connections to the data that were invisibly collected about them and used for marketing. Given the importance of making the invisible visible within their own growing understanding, the youth included this in their designs that when they sought to teach peers and family members about threats to equity. In this design, the youth designers created a computer game where the player's avatar experiences threats to equity as they are playing to better understand the biases that technology can hold. So the group focused on access to technology, to technology discriminating based on race or gender, and to having uh, representation on design teams. The end of the game is modeled on the laptop screen that you see in the middle, where the player sees a techwitable experience of two girls and one boy on a design team together and says, so that's what techwitty is. The youth also made PSAs to tell others about threats to techwitty. In these PSAs, the youth often used one sprite to explain a tequity topic to another. 
In this example, you see two sprites, an apple and a dragon, having a conversation about how much information to share about yourself online and limiting what information is shared. In this PSA, uh, in a second PSA, the youth creator explained that the dragon comes into a city where tech companies are treating people unfairly, and the tech companies would have the opportunity to change their ways. Otherwise, the dragon would destroy their company. And when asked, the youth designer explained that humans can try to stop tech companies, but when the tech companies don't listen, then the dragon was there to destroy them. This demonstrates not only an understanding of how pervasive threats to tech would are, but also some of the difficulty there is to overcoming and how people individually might not have the power to stop inequality with tech, but that larger focuses such as a government body as the Algorithmic Justice League has advocated for might be necessary. These findings show that youth are aware of te tech equity topics and how technology is affecting their lives, but they don't always have the words or they need tangible examples to explain it. With the lesson materials that we're designing, we are working to make the invisible aspects of tech equity visible and use the understanding of youth conceptualizations of tech equity to support learners as they come to better understand the technological world with which they interact. Thank you very much, and I look forward to answering any questions. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Marika. Um, so like before, uh, feel free to raise your hand or drop a question in the chat for Marika. Um, so I will get us rolling. So uh, Marika, one of the things that's so great about working with kids is they always do things that are so unexpected. Um, and, and so in some case, some of the examples that you shared that unex that the, the thing that surprised me was the sophistication of the way that kids were thinking about technology. So I'm curious to get your take on either examples that kids shared that were just totally out of left field and things that you hadn't considered or times that you you were surprised by the way that they reasoned about the technology in their lives and, and threats to equity that might exist yeah i mean i was i will definitely say that i would one of the surprising moments was when one of the girls uh was like oh yeah security cameras are good but also when i sneak out they catch me and i was like i i don't know quite how to respond to you because you're uh 12 and i'm a little worried about the fact that you're sneaking out of your house um but I think that overall, um, I was very impressed with them and their and their understanding of technology. And I think it um, it kind of shows why designing with kids is so important because um, as Alison Druin has talked about in her literature, like we don't know what kids are thinking and we often think we know and we're totally off base. And so the fact that kids could very clearly articulate issues with internet and access and laptops and chargers and all of these things that they were experiencing within school, I think really colored those initial, especially those initial design sessions where they had just turned online um, and talking about how them or their friends would miss class because they couldn't find their laptop charger or because someone's internet glitched. Um, I also, this was um, in, in knowing that time and, and context is everything, um, the the kids had recently learned about uh how fortnite was designed specifically to be uh addicting and so uh, about how the game design included things that they thought would like catch people in and capture it and one of the de kid designers was really into fortnite and so like a month before these sessions they had all kind of um not ganged up on but lovingly uh talked to their friend about how he should stop playing fortnite because it was going to make him addicted and they did they were worried about him and that then came back up in this session and so i think i was surprised by some of those understandings of these underworkings of where technology companies are coming from and why they're trying to do some of the things that they're doing that we often think kids don't notice but they really do wonderful thank you I mean, I think we have time for one more question. Um, Dr. Tammy has her hand politely raised, so the floor is yours, Tammy. 
Hi, thank you for this great talk times two, Marika. I got to see it times. Um, <laughs> and so, so um, one question I had was, I wondered, like, were there times when you saw the kids thinking about the social justice equity types of issues? Like, you know, um, my it didn't uh, take some of the AI stuff doesn't detect my skin because the you know, the, or my, my skin tone or something like that, right? Like, were there times when maybe some of the racial, socioeconomic or any of those kinds of things came up in a childlike way? Um, so I think some of it came up in the access conversations with around, um, more around socioeconomic status, I think, than around um, race. It didn't come up as much um, explicitly from them around some of the topics with like sensors or voice recognition. Once I talked about them, they the kids would agree. So like I there were I presented these and did kind of a question and answer kind of um, like Socratic style discussion introducing these threats to tech equity. And so when I said things like you know Siri sometimes doesn't understand people with accents, then they would be like, oh that happens to so and so. And so they would start they started to make the connections when it was introduced to them, but I didn't see them making some of those. Um, connections on their own. A lot of them were more based on, um, they made a lot of connections to ads and their um, behavior online and different things like that. Wonderful. Uh, thank you again, Marika. Um, so moving right along, um, our next uh, presenter is Peter Moon, who will be presenting his talk and hopefully we see the screen. Yep. Uh, his talk entitled Interpreting Representational Fluency and Computational Thinking Enhanced Math Activities. Uh, Peter, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Peter Moon, as David introduced. Thank you, David. And I'm here on behalf of the Sphero.math project. Um, today, I'd like to spend some time discussing our observations on representational fluency in CT enhanced math activities. So STEM learning often involves the critical ability to navigate across concepts and representations when solving problems. The skill of representational fluency or translating between representations of a concept like graphs, tables, equations, verbal and embodied representations and more can help learners make sense of their environments and relate what they're seeing to their other experiences and knowledge. If you've ever looked at the physics graph and been really confused about what it represented, you understand why representational fluency is so important. So here we're gonna see a general process of translation between representations in a robotics challenge. So beginning on the top left, the student receives a challenge to make the robot drive two blocks. Um, they translate this into a verbal understanding. So probably supported by some pointing, like pointing out the route of the robot but here we see the robot needs to move two tiles forwards from here to there. Um, this can be translated into code. I have made some fake scratch code here that represents sort of what the robot might do. And then that would translate into a successful solution by the robot. So this is an example of representational fluency in kind of the domain of CT and programming and robotics. In our research, we explored how learners might use representational fluency to engage with computational thinking activities through the use of a rolling Sphero robot. And we'll talk about what that is in just a moment. So this research occurs in the context of Sphero.math, a multi-year research initiative to integrate computational thinking lessons in elementary math classrooms, specifically now fourth grade in DC public schools. Lessons are designed in close collaboration with DCPS teachers to match the instructional goals of their classrooms. Um, and they're taught by those same DCPS teachers and some others with Maryland researchers observing in the classroom. In these lessons, students use mobile devices or tablets to program a rolling Sphero robot seen here on the right to carry out various commands like rolling specific distances and directions. These activities are linked to specific mathematical objectives, and we'll look at an activity in which students explore prime and composite numbers, as well as angle measurements through their programming tasks. This is a particularly opportune moment to observe representational fluency in action. Our activities place learners in multimodal contexts where they can translate between multiple representations of a program there are speech and gesture representations used to communicate about what the robot should do. 
There's the code used in the program for the robot's actual actions, and of course, the actual movement of the robot following its program. So our analysis here is going to look at two pairs, looked at two pairs of students, each recorded by both head-mounted cameras as they were working, and also a stationary camera that captured their work on the CT activity. In this particular lesson, students were programming the robot to roll through a maze, passing only over prime numbers and avoiding composite numbers in a path from start to finish. Uh, we looked through available video footage to see how students translated from their planned path to a program that would guide the Sphere robot through the maze. Two members of the research team watched through the videos and added memos at moments that seemed to show representational fluency at work then compared notes afterwards to bolster inter-rater reliability. So I have a compiled video uh, of some moments from one of our focal groups that I'd like to look at. Should be here. Sorry, I just heard that there's no audio on the video, so I'm gonna try just to reshare this real quick. Sorry about that. No, we didn't do much. Let me back up. Wait, we can just loop this. See, it goes there and there, and then it goes that, that. So we, we can just loop that. Oh yeah, just loop that, just loop that. You're smart. Oh yeah, just loop it really quick. Because we go to seven, 25, 37, 23. All right, yeah, 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 yeah. No. No, what are you doing? All right, yeah, yeah. All right, let's try it, let's try it. We'll put one, twice. Twice, yeah. All right, let's go. What the? What, okay, no, it needs, it needs, it needs more delay. Keep going to three. What was your strategy when you were uh, coding? We used 35 speed for everything. Mm -hmm. And for every box, that would be about 30. About 35 speed. And about six, six tenths of a second to get into every box at 35 speed. We changed how long it was traveling at 30, about 35 speed. Oh, so got like, you. One of the boxes, like to get to the end, since, um, the boxes were small, we made it, wait, was it 0.3? Yeah, we made it 0.3 even though our usual would be 0.6 because these boxes weren't that even. Sorry about that. Um, so as they began to move from pointing to their fingers and listing off numbers to an actual program, the students noticed repetition in their path that could be used to write more efficient code through use of a loop. Uh, the students are translating here between a repeated gesture and verbal recognition of that repeated gesture uh, to a way of communicating this repeat in the language of the robot through this loop. In addition to this translation, we also see students translating the idea of a block seen on the maze into robot code. So they describe uh, moving forward one block by using a consistent 35 speed for six tenths of a second. As you heard in their interview though, this translation wasn't perfect for the whole uh, maze and alternate code was required. This is because some of the blocks were smaller than some of the other blocks and correspondingly the students fixed their uh, program by instructing the robot to roll for a shorter period of time for these later blocks. So that is an example of how sort of this code did not translate perfectly into the real world and students had to adapt that code to make it uh, work. I wanted to briefly point out that the activity we just showed you maps to a bunch of existing math standards and also existing computer science standards. So to highlight a couple places where objectives map to the standards, students need to recognize which numbers on the maze are prime and which are composite to help them uh, find the path. They also need to identify angles correctly to guide the Sphero through the maze with the right turns in the code. 
Students also have to break down uh, the path through the maze into smaller steps in order to code a program that will guide the robot successfully through the maze. And of course, while the code can be written uh, without loops, using a looped algorithm within the code for the upright upright movement, which is repeated twice as we saw, gives a more efficient solution. So it's getting into a couple different CT skills. Along the way, uh, students can also engage in interesting discussions that combine the CT and math ideas from the previous slide. These are a couple of examples of questions in the lesson plan. The first two questions speak to angle measurement. Students should be able to link uh, these angle measures to specific turns made by Spiro and of course in the language of Sphero. Um, the final question asks students to describe the debugging process and any adjustments they made to the code as they went through the activity and refined their solution. So this is asking students to pry into that debugging process, which is really a translational process from code to actuation. Uh, some notes on future directions. First, when watching students progress, it would be really helpful to have a way to observe their code changing as they work. So this could be done either through recording of their screen as they're working in the Sphero app or through simple snapshots at different points in the process as they're working through the code. Second, since we've recently redesigned most of the Sphero.math curriculum, really all of the Sphero.math curriculum, uh, we can now look for more places uh, in which students are translating between representations in these new activities. And finally, this is a useful reminder that Sphero and CT integrations are useful not just to mathematics, our primary focus, but also to other fields within STEM through this representational fluency and potentially in other ways outside the fields of STEM. Thank you all for your time. Uh, if you have any questions, my email is on the slide. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Thank you Peter. Um, Peter, um, the, I see Tammy, Dr. Tammy has her hand politely up. So Dr. Tammy, the floor is yours again. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Dave. I love how the digital raising my hand is polite. <laughs> um, so I, um, I was, I really enjoyed your talk, Peter. Um, and I was wondering, and for the second time, because um, I got to hear it before, and I was wondering this time, did did um, what did, like did the teachers in the in the room like we heard the teacher in the um, in the video um, prompting the kids. And I was just wondering, like, do you feel did, from the from the data that you guys collected, or from your observations in the um, in the classroom, did, did it seem like the teachers were recognizing the um, the the sort of the fluency that the kids were um, exhibiting, or ways that they were meeting the standards, or kind of what were the teachers' reflections on the session? Uh, good question. So I think to some degree, this depends on whether the teacher was uh, involved with us in designing some of these lessons. We have a couple of teachers that have been with us for a couple of years now and have been like integral in helping design a lot of these lessons. And I think they're hyper aware of where these kind of uh, fluency moments occur, uh, mostly because they've been like with us along the way, intentionally creating moments where these things can happen. Um, we also have some newer teachers that either, well, I think both have joined teaching and our project within the last year or two. And I think that being less involved in the project also makes them a little less aware of those moments. Um, so I think there's some variation there. Great, thank you. Um, Caro typed a question in chat. Caro, do you want me to read that or do you wanna take the mic? I'll read it. So Kara asks how representational fluency and the types of translating that we just, you, you talked about in this presentation how might those fit together with what we saw in Janet's presentation before this around kind of grounding this embodied experience? Um, do, do you see those as supporting each other, distinct from each other, just kind of reflecting on your work alongside hers? Yeah, great question. Um, and I'm lucky to have had the chance to work closely with Janet uh, through a lot of this and, and try to parse these out. And I was actually contemplating that when I was watching her talk earlier. And this is what I think is that the, the grounding through embodied cognition process is often like the really occurs in the early steps of this representational process, especially for these CT activities. Because I think when you're getting your bearings on what it is that you're actually doing in the activity, it's very useful to use embodied cognition practices. Um, and of course, I think they play a supportive role throughout as, as participants are always gonna be using their hands and bodies to figure out what's going on. 
But I think especially in the planning stage is where those uh, actions are most useful. Great, thank you, Peter. And I think we have time for one more question. Um, and so Ekta is politely raising her hand. So Ekta, all you. Uh, so like my question is uh, about the mat that were being used in the activity. I think it was being part of like the same activity like Janet and your thing, but uh, neither of you talk about like how the mat was being used and who made the mat and how was the organization of the numbers were being placed i was wondering whether it was the freedom with the kids to like decide their own mat or like what was the agency in the activity given to the kids yeah so if i remember correctly and david feel free to jump in and correct me if i'm wrong but i think that one group would design the prime composite maze hand it off to the other group and that group would have to code their way through it um so there was each group was kind of creating the maze and then passing it off uh to another group so there was some there um i think as the as we've kind of done this and other activities we've noticed that the the math here is easy to do in the beginning and then forget about to some degree, especially with the prime composite uh, stuff. And some of our more recent activities, I think, have students more focused on the math throughout the entire activity. Great, wonderful. Thank you, Peter. Um, and our last speaker in this session uh, is Heather Killen, and she'll be presenting her talk entitled Opportunities for Community Building When Using a Hybrid Citizen Science Protocol, Pairing Online Data Reporting and Geographically Dispersed Physical Sample Collection. Heather, the floor is yours. Thank you. And everyone can see my slide, correct? Great. Okay. Well, I'm excited to be here um, and talk about combining online data reporting and physical sample collection. Um, let me figure out how to forward my slides that didn't want to do that. Okay. Um, so as David said, my name is Heather Killen, and I'm going to share work I did um, as part of the Fossil Atmospheres Project. Uh, Fossil Atmospheres is housed in the Paleobiology Department at the National Museum of Natural History at the Smithsonian. And there I'm part of a team that includes Lucy Chang, Laura Soul, and Rich Barclay. And Lucy, Laura, and Rich are all paleobiologists, and I'm a learning scientist. And half of me keeps disappearing, which is going to really uh, distract me, but <laughs> oh well. Um, so in the past, we've shared this work with the science community and the citizen science community, but we're excited to be here today and share with the HCI community because we think a lot of the implications of the user experience we designed cut across many community-based HCI endeavors especially those thinking about learning or engagement. And so I'm going to start, and actually I think I'll use my mouse for a second. Um, there, all right. I'm gonna start by talking about the project. So um, fossil atmospheres looks at ginkgo leaves and we want with the goal of thinking about or understanding how the leaf structure of ginkgo leaves can tell us more about how temperature changes and how climate might change over the long term. So we use modern ginkgo leaves, which you see on the screen there. And these are either ones that are growing out in the world or ones that we grow in experimental conditions. And then we also use herbarium leaves. These are leaves that have been collected by botanists and then dried and stored in herbarium collections. And some of these can be hundreds of years old. And then we use fossil leaves, which of course are millions of years old. And we're able to compare those cellular structures. So our project has three main parts. Um, we have a citizen science leaf collection where we ask people to go out into their neighborhoods and look for ginkgo trees and send us leaves. So this is a way to collect a sample of leaves. We have a citizen science um, portion that is asking people to help us do the cell counts. So this is when we take the leaf and we do a very close up image of it and uh, we post that on the virtual citizen science platform Zooniverse and then people are able to log in and help us count the different kinds of cell structures that they see in those images. And then the third part of the experiment is out um, at the research center where Rich is growing trees in carefully controlled conditions that increase the CO2 to see what kind of effects that might have. 
So today we're going to be talking, I'm going to be talking about this first part of the project, the citizen leaf collection. So in 2019, in August, we asked people across the United States to go out and collect leaves for us. Um, we were, we ended up being very successful. We had 562 people come in uh, or mail us back leaves. We asked them to do it using two methods. Um, iNaturalist, which is an online social network site, and that's where we asked people to collect to record the data they were collecting about the area of the and the tree. And then the US Postal Service was how they were going to get their sample to us. So um, as I said, we got 562 samples from 352 people. Um, and the, that included 37 states and six countries. So we were very successful. Um, why did we choose iNaturalist? So, um, we chose iNaturalist for three main reasons. First of all, it's very well established. It's a worry-free platform. It's optimized for use out of doors. So if somebody wants to um, stand at a tree and use their phone to make the observations, that will work really well. It, um, if they don't have that cap capability, they can also go back afterwards to a computer and upload it there, um, upload data there. It has a large active user population and it's really well established. And then, so, so the way iNaturalist works is you go out, you find something you're interested in, you take a picture of it and you upload it to the, to the application, to the site. And then as soon as that happens, um, iNaturalist has machine learning and computer vision algorithms that give you a choice of what they think that picture is. Um, and then you, you either choose one of those or you upload or you type in what you think it is and um, it gets posted to the site. And then other people are able, who are on the site and who wind up being very um, knowledgeable users are able to double check that and confirm that that is in fact the correct identification for the organism. So this was really powerful for us. 100% um, of the samples we ended up getting, all 562 samples were ginkgo. We didn't get any other kinds of trees. Um, granted, ginkgo is not that difficult to um, identify. It's only has one species that has survived into the modern world. And it has a really unique fan-shaped leaf. But for projects that were, were are asking um, citizen scientists to engage with more difficult to identify organisms, this would be really, really powerful for them. And then the last reason to think about digital data collection is because it does standardize how the results are collected. So um, with the iNaturalist app, people are going to be logged in at the tree. That's going to automatically collect the time that they are uploading their photos and the location of those photos. So they don't have to worry about doing that if they're using the app at the tree. And then iNaturalist supported us as a project adding extra fields to what the user was going to see. So we were able to add unique fields that would meet our scientific needs and our protocol. And so that is seen there at the bottom of the screen. Some of the questions we included were the tree height or the tree sex, which were important to our study. And um, we were able to do that with drop down menus, which also was able to standardize the data. All right. So a lot of citizen science projects will um, ask people to collect data online. That's very, very common. Um, also, there are projects that ask people to collect data locally in the real world and then, and then or, or samples, not data, um, collect samples locally. So actually go out and, and collect water or collect leaves or collect insects and then um, submit them to the project. But we actually were trying to do both, which is why we call this a hybrid pro protocol. And as far as we know, we are the first project to attempt this kind of protocol on a national scale. So we are asking people to go out to find a tree to collect data um, online and then also to grab a leaf and to mail it to us. So this took some kind of careful design work, which we decide, which looking back, we, we um, have decided kind of fell into three main stages. 
there was choosing, designing, and engaging. So choosing came first. We had to choose the online platform. We had to think about data storage capabilities, and we had to think about how the data was going to be um, thought about and stored and how we were going to get it off again. Then we had to think about the sampling period. We obviously had to take into account our scientific goal. So um, summer worked well when the leaves were on the trees, but we also didn't want to do it for too long because we didn't want to lose momentum. And we didn't want to do it for too short because we didn't we wanted a chance for people to engage and to advertise. So we wound up deciding on a month and that that seemed to have worked pretty well. Then we had to go into a really careful design. So we had to um, design robust data practices. This included a data management plan. We had to know what we were going to do when we got the sample, the physical samples in from the mail. We had to know how we were going to get the data off of iNaturalist that people had uploaded. And then most importantly, we had to know how we were going to how we we're going to pair those two sources of data back up to create a complete record. Um, we had to design clear and concise guides and protocols so that people did what we needed them to do uh, without you know, any face-to-face -face interaction from us. And then we had to design a user interface, in our case, this was a website, to share these guides and protocols and, um, and uh, let people know what we needed them to do for us. And then lastly, we need to convince them to do it. So um, we winded up spending a lot of time on social media. And we also had some com community partnerships that we, uh, we worked with. Whoops, sorry about that. I'm clicking the wrong thing. All right. Oh, now I'm really clicking the wrong thing. Ooh. All right, sorry about that. I'll do it that way rather than use my mouse. Um, okay, so the participant experience. Um, we doing this hybrid um, protocol was complicated. And so we had to design carefully to accommodate for that. And I think um, those challenges we were able to overcome and we were successful and we got the sampling that we, um, we needed to meet the scientific transects that the, um, the, the science required. So in that case, we were, we were a very, very successful project. But as we reflected on the project, we realized well, we hadn't designed for many opportunities for community engagement. And um, as and I we we really feel like the participants noticed that because we saw that they strove for ways to engage with us. So two of those ways were through email and social media. So we had an email address and we got some questions there about protocol um, and what what they were supposed to do and how they were supposed to do it. But we also got a lot of encouragement around the project. We got a lot of interest. We got people sharing stories. And that was true in social media as well. And we we had kind of expected this level of engagement, but uh, or at least this this mode of engagement, maybe maybe not the to the level that we saw. We also though saw that people were sending in their samples in envelopes that were decorated and had notes and had uh, hand drawings. And um, that was completely unexpected. We we had not, you know, asked them to certainly decorate their their mailers, and um, and it it really showed us that there was there was a, a a a real desire among some participants to to kind of have a, a deeper engagement with the project, and um, and we honestly hadn't hadn't designed for that. This was going to be a um, almost a pilot effort. We weren't sure how the protocol was going to work. We weren't sure that people were going to be able to do what we needed that needed them to do in the transects that we needed. Um, we had hoped to do it again. I said the first one happened in 2019. We had hoped to do a second iteration in 2020. And of course that did not happen. Um, but it did leave us with this question that we still, because we weren't able to do this again last year, we haven't answered yet. And um, whoops, I'm gonna skip that part. And that is, does this experience have to be lonely, right? We designed a very successful um, 
very independent protocol where people were able to do what we needed them to do and they never had to have any face-to-face -face time with us they never had to have any face-to-face -face time with each other um but that does mean that there's there's very little community and we we feel that citizen science should probably be about community right it should, there, there's a, a great opportunity to build community there so we think that as we and other citizen science research teams explore how to use technology like this in projects it's worthwhile to consider ways that we lacked um, community and how we could design differently in the future so we had um so we had been thinking about how do we connect these red dots like so these red dots are, are all participants in alabama and georgia how do we connect these people to each other and then how do we how do we get people to have a deeper experience with the project rather than just collecting what we need from them so um our an obvious and original idea was to do things collaboratively and that was had been our plan in 2020 we hope to uh, partner with some local organizations and uh, bring people together to collaboratively um, collect leads for us. Another possible way to uh, build community would be to have some kind of shared digital space. So this would keep the experience um, virtual, but would allow an opportunity for people to come together in a more informal way and not just be asking us uh, questions, but share with each other their love of ginkgo or their interest in climate change. And then lastly, we think it's important to situate these kind of projects in a larger community, um, which we hadn't really done in this first iteration. So um, a, lot of, a lot of different groups are interested, both online and in real life in citizen science. And so I think becoming part of that larger community of, of interest is a, is a good way to build community. But we know that these are just beginning ideas. Um, and so we're interested in thinking about, together with everyone here, how we can make the experience of participating in a fossil atmospheres project like this more meaningful and, uh, and, and a broader experience. All right. So um, that's my email. And I'm happy to uh, take any questions. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Heather. Round of applause. Um, so a first question in the chat comes from Jenny Priest, who starts by saying, great talk, Heather. Thank you, Jenny. And then asks, you mentioned several challenges, but what was the biggest unexpected challenge you encountered in your project and how did you deal with it? Oh, the unexpected challenge. This is like a work, it's like I'm applying for a job. <laughs> The unexpected challenge. Um, I think probably we had not anticipated the trickiness of um, marrying back or pairing back together these two data streams. So we had the iNaturalist information and we had the samples. And some people had sent samples and they had not done anything in iNaturalist. Some people had done stuff in iNaturalist and not sent any samples. Um, and then we had enough people participate that I think every potential problem or uh, misunderstanding of the protocol was able to happen. I really feel like we, we hit on every possible um, concern that, that people could or, or strange thing people could do. So that that made it a little bit messy um, matching those two things up and uh, we have we have in press or, or under consideration a paper that talks about that because we did learn some really good lessons about how to uh, pair up those two kinds of data streams and um, and how to do it successfully and we we ended up being able to use a, over 85% of what we what we were um, sent so uh, people for the most part did an excellent job and gave complete data. Um, and we were able to uh, overcome a lot of little uh, small mistakes they may have made in the protocol to, to get everything paired back up. Wonderful. Uh, well, we are at four o'clock on the dot. And so there are a few more questions in the chat, but I invite everyone to 
join us at Kumo Space for a virtual post conference reception. Ah, and Tammy just dropped the link in there. And so if you have further questions for Heather or any of today's presenters, um, please feel free to virtually and politely stalk them in Kumo Space if they're there and, and continue the conversation there. Um, so with that, I'd like to again uh, thank all of today's presenters. Um, and yeah, I look forward to continuing the conversation virtually and before too long in person. So thank you all. Also, thank you, Dr. Dave, and thank you, Brianna, for volunteering um, and supporting the, um, the session. Yes, thank you, Brianna. I'm so sorry to <laughs> not call you out. Thank you. You did a wonderful job. No problem.